Welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, brought to you by the experts at Maryfield Garden Center. Join us as we discover beautiful plants, new trends, and exciting ideas for your landscape. So let's get growing together. Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, bringing out the best in your garden. Happy Saturday, everybody, and welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. So glad you could join us this morning. I'm Debbie Warhurst Cap, and along with me is David Yost. Good morning, David. Good morning. And I have a big thank you for to give to David because David is stepping in here. As I mentioned last week, Amy Strunk is, was supposed to be here today, uh, and she had put together a great show on gardening for the five senses, and is feeling a bit under the weather today. So David, at the last minute, stepped in. So thank you so much. Yeah. Well, of course, I'm always happy to be here. I so know. Um, I, I know. hope Amy's feeling better, and sorry she couldn't be here That's today. That's right. But gardening with the five senses, a great topic. It really is. It's interesting uh, the concept that Amy came up with. It's so true. We um, basically we tend to rely on our vision, our eyes. Right. We're always describing <clears throat> plants in terms of what color they are and their flowers and those type of things. Uh, but she's pointing out, making a good point here, really we use all of our senses uh, to observe plants and that's what we're talking about today. Uh, plants that peel to the eyes, you know, with their vision, plants that peel the nose with great scent, plants that taste good, plants that have an interesting touch to it and feel to it. So we're going to look at plants from a, a broad perspective today. Great. And since it's winter time, she kind of geared everything to the inside, but with a few nods to the outside as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Same ideas apply indoors or outdoors. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, be, uh, and later on in the show, we will be taking your phone calls. So save those questions up and give us a call. Today we're very excited because it's the beginning of our winter spring series of gardening seminars, free gardening seminars at all three Maryfield Garden Center locations. Now this is a great way to learn about gardening. They are, first of all, they're free. That's yeah, probably free the best is part. always good. Yeah, free is always good. They're chock full of information and you've got an opportunity to ask questions. So that's great. So we've got a whole wide range of topics starting with today at our Maryfield location, Jonathan Cavalier, uh, who used to work with us and is now at the, at the Smithsonian. So that's great. He's going to be talking about orchids. So that's at 10 a.m. at the Maryfield Community Hall, which re is right next door to our Maryfield location at the intersection of Lee Highway and Gallows Road in Maryfield. 10 a.m. orchids. At our Fair Oaks location, uh, you're going to be talking about a gardener's calendar. And Mr. Yost here beside me is going to leave here as soon as the show is over and run over there because you're presenting that one. Exactly. People a lot of times still don't realize it's a live show that we broadcast right. down here in Arlington <laughs> and then got to zip, zip right back, back there to uh, get to this class. But there's time to do that. Mm -hmm. And when it's about gardener's calendar, we're going to sort of look at the sequence or the timing of a lot of practices in the garden. So right. we we'll go kind of January, February, March, uh, work through the year of um, things that you can be doing in your garden, really keep it in good shape. Uh, so for example, we'll start out, we'll talk about pruning as a wintertime mm -hmm. activity, you know, touch on seed starting, lawn care, vegetable gardens, so it's a broad a range. Bit of everything. Exactly, but unfortunately it's just kind of a superficial treatment right. because of the timing. Absolutely. You have to make sure to have plenty of our Maryfield calendars there with you. Uh, I've asked them to there put those out, but really so much of gardening is doing the right <coughs> thing at the right time. That's right. That's great. Okay, so we'll we'll get you out of here quickly as quick as we can. And at our Gainesville location today, uh, Regina Langto is going to be talking about terrariums. Uh, now she's going to give the presentation, and then if I'm understanding this correct, she's going to stay afterwards and help anyone who wants to put a terrarium together. Is that right? Uh, that's right, because okay. I heard I was talking to Stephanie Brock, who's going to be down there to help her out, Great. you know, okay. so we can give that kind of individual attention to people who show up. But the seminar itself will be kind of a how-to yes. overview type of thing. So that's at 10 a.m. at our Gainesville location. That's at 6895 Wellington Road in Gainesville. So if you have not gotten your seminar schedule in the, in the mail, that means you're not on our mailing list yet. So if you want to sign up, uh, just call the store or go on on our website and sign up for that. You can pick up the whole seminar schedule in the store as well. And as you can see, the next week we've got another three great topics, color and interest in the winter garden, how to be a successful gardener, and bonsai for beginners. And this, so this is just the start of the seminars. They go through April and there's a wide range of, of topics. So it's a great, great thing to be a part of. It's a great opportunity to learn more about gardening and it's fun. So. Take advantage of that yeah. while you're in the store. So get there a few minutes early. Good I time. try to get people to do that. I mean, you're welcome to come in last minute, but right. you may be at the back of the room. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, because we never know how many people are going to show up. So uh, while you're in the store, 
the after Christmas sale is still still going on, but we're packing things away. So if you want a last chance to grab something, I have a feeling this weekend is the time to do it because uh, after that things will probably be all put away. It is. I know in our store, that's what we look at. We left a lot of displays out, but we've talked about said, okay, get, leave it out for this weekend, get those last minute deals, and then that's it. Absolutely. We gotta get set up for spring. Right. And one more thing, you know, last week we talked about pruning, and one of our landscape designers, Seth Crippen, uh, got in touch with us and said, hey, you forgot to tell everybody that Maryfield does pruning services, which I was upset that we didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, obviously we, we should have mentioned that. Exactly. I tend to work with a do-it-yourself audience right. and that's exactly. who I was appealing to. Right, so we have a whole host of pruning services. If you need something done, especially if it's something tall and you can't get to it yourself, uh, just give us a call uh, at the Garden Center and someone will come out and give you, you know, see what you need to have done and, and get it, get you taken care of. We also do stump removals and and just all kinds of things. So yeah, basically anything you need done outside the house, we're there to help That's you. That's for sure. That's for sure. Okay, gardening for the five senses. Want to give us kind of an overview? Yeah. Well, as far as getting started, mm -hmm. you know, we uh, like I said, we do uh, look at plants from a visual perspective, and and we're going to talk about that in other ways. But when you're selecting plants, there's several things that you need to keep in mind. One is we talk about their cultural requirements. Uh, we need to match plants, realize that these are living uh, beings. You know, they, it's not just a piece of furniture that you move around throughout your home, but you need to make sure that you have the proper lighting for it. Uh, we want to make sure we have the correct humidity, provide the correct growing conditions for it. Uh, so with one of those, one of the first things I like to sort of keep in mind is the lighting. Plants, they photosynthesize. Mm -hmm. uh, they need light. Uh, so a lot of times in our homes, that becomes the limiting factor. Right. You know, because, you know, we, even light that's coming through the window is greatly diminished. Mm -hmm. And if you have curtains in there, plus the winter time being short right. days, we need to make sure that we match them to light conditions. Or if we don't have the proper lighting for plants, we try to change our environment mm -hmm. by adding supplemental lighting. So there are things like this as a, um, a grow ball, but sort of a high intensity version of it for fluorescent lights. Or again, we're going more towards energy efficiency. Oh, so yes. even we have these compact fluorescents. But my point is we need to make sure we provide good sunlight for them. Right. If we're not able to provide that, then the next step we're gonna do is actually so. supplement that uh, by putting some additional lighting. Uh, these are, for the most part, tropical plants we're growing. Uh, they grow in very humid, uh, bright filtered light. I also brought in a little bit of a humidity tray. This is a, something that we can do to sort of boost the humidity. Because on the winter time, like I said, the, the days are short, the lights diminish, our heater comes on, the humidity's low. Right. These are stressful conditions for growing plants in the house. Uh, but we can take these little steps to make it a bit easier for them so that they thrive and do even better. Right. I think pets and kids are another thing you should look at as well, just you know, where you're putting things and that type of thing. It sure is, because we're talking about how we uh, experience plants. And you think of small children, mm -hmm. what's the first thing they do? Any any new thing they encounter, it's into the mouth. Right, right. Uh, so if you have small children in the at home, you want to keep the plants, you know, in a location, a, a kid-proof mm -hmm. type of environment. Uh, I was thinking back, I know when I used to have a cat, you know, I looked at my beautiful spathophyllum, all she saw was a litter box, right. you know. So th these are just things that, you know, you have to think about, Absolutely. you know, to make it a good experience for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break and come back with great ideas for you and your home. Stay tuned. We're talking about gardening for the five senses today. And so we've got sight, taste, touch, smell. What am I missing? I don't know. I'm trying to think. I'd... <laughs> sight. It's early sight. in the morning. <laughs> okay. Let's well, start we're gonna with cover sight. It, right? Let's exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hearing. That's right. That, yeah, I knew we'd come to it, it right. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. Okay, so we've so got a few pictures to start exactly. off with. But really, we do we do tend to describe our gardens in terms of visual terms. Right, so uh, everything is in... It, exactly, yeah. and that's, hey, that's what it's all about. So we talk about the visual impact on plants, uh, color, mm -hmm. you know, that's where it's at. We know that in our industry, that's what we are all about, and we're always there providing color. Uh, typically, we're talking about flower color, but a lot of times when we're in the greenhouse or gardening indoors, 
these tropical plants were also talking about foliar color and mm -hmm. leaf color in there. So the croton that you were seeing in there, that croton uh, is a plant that to maintain that bright color in there really needs very bright uh, mm -hmm. sunny conditions. So you want to place that right in the window where it's getting some direct sun. Uh, if it's getting anything less than that, it starts shedding leaves and the color right. starts to fade on there. But definitely a dramatic tropical oh, plant. It's beautiful. Tough and durable and easy, mm -hmm. provided you can get some sunlight there to it. There you go. All right. And yeah. lots of different patterns and everything available into it. Now, in addition to color, uh, this is a good example of different leaf shape that's in there. Uh, this is a philodendron, philodendron salome. Uh, you can see some smaller ones around there. The salome gets really big, really dramatic. Uh, this is even a baby plant that you see in there. They can continue to grow, so it's something that you need to provide some space for. But again, it's tough, it's durable. Uh, we don't have that variegation. We don't necessarily have that leaf color. So the green leaf plant like that tends to do better in lower light conditions. Right. So again, we're talking about matching the right plant to your environment. Mm -hmm. Light is a primary consideration that's in there. And basically, if you want to get those bright variegated colors, you're going to need to have sunlight and lower light conditions. We can go with something like that philodendron, which still gives us a lot of interest in the right. leaf shape. Um, but not going to provide the vibrant color. And like there. I say, there's so many different varieties and, and varieties of shapes, that's what makes it really interesting. There are, and our next plant coming up here is um, kind of a combination of the two, mm -hmm. let's say. <laughs> uh, this is a um, uh, alocasia, or sometimes it's called African mask. Uh, and what we're getting there is, you know, again, it's, uh, it will tolerate, you know, sort of a medium light conditions. And here, it's a, a dark, almost black coloration in the leaf, but it's the veins of that leaf that really pop out and starts to look Stunned. dramatic. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, visually, when we're observing these plants, it adds so much interest. But this is kind of neat because it has color on the underside right. of the leaf. So we're looking at it top side, but when you flip it over, you start to see a little bit of that almost purple coloration Very that's cool. in there. Mm -hmm. So again, there's, there's <laughs> a lot that these plants have to offer us. Absolutely. And we brought several plants to show as well. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, let's, so we'll just bring them over. Um, again, these are, um, you know, we're putting it under our <laughs> site category. Uh, you know, this is a that? staghorn fern. Uh, you can see there it's what's called an epiphyte. It naturally grows up in the tree branches. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't grow down in the soil. It's one that it actually takes the moisture right the, through the rainfall that's um, out there, uh, through the humidity. This is interesting because it's been mounted on a board there. So this could actually be for vertical garden. You could just literally hang that on a wall uh, and really display that in, oh, in an interesting way. It just gets more and more dramatic with time. Again, because it gets its moisture right through the um, through the atmosphere, it's something that needs to be in a high humidity area, a plant that needs to be frequently misted mm -hmm. uh, to keep it in good health. But it will grow in low light environments uh, if provided you give it the nice humidity. Okay. Uh, another my, good example we talked about with an epiphyte, you know, these plants that grow not in the soil but grow up in the tree canopies and in the in the branch crotches and everything. Uh, these are a lot of times we just refer to as air plants or tillandsia. Again, they have these specialized scales along their leaves and they literally just suck their moisture right out of the um, air. But when I say that, they grow in a, in a rainforest environment. So when we have them in our home, it is important that they get misted frequently. I brought just a little oh, great. Uh, mister mm -hmm. in, kind of demonstrate their yeah, oh. hope I didn't get you. Right. But uh, it's something that we would want to go through mist frequently so they can get that moisture right through the leaves. Mm -hmm. Or what I would do sometimes is even take that and just drop them into a little pot of water or something, let's soak, oh, yeah. and then hang them back up. Mm -hmm. uh, you can put them out as refrigerator magnets right. or any kind of way. see what else I can find over here. I'm just going to bring over. Yeah, and these are all plants that Amy had suggested for us for a mm -hmm. nice, good visual uh, appeal to the senses. And here again, this Fetonia, and there's several different varieties. There are some that will have a pink variegation in the leaf. This one has a nice white variegation. Uh, this is a plant that you're going to grow down in the soil as opposed mm -hmm. to we were looking at some epiphytes before. Uh, just want to kind of keep it uniformly moist, but again, visually look at that pattern yep. that's going on in the veins. So she's shown us a couple plants here today that have this interesting venation in there. Very cool. And then Debbie, you're holding oh. what really is one of my favorite this is plants. stunning. I love this. Uh, you know, I love them all. But the thing is, this plant is just tough as nails. I literally have 
five plants in my house. Mm -hmm. I'm not like huge on the house right, plants because right. I don't put the time and attention into it. Mm -hmm. I've had one of these in my home for five years, so you know it's got to be tough. Right. It's lived in my <laughs> care for five years. Uh, it's um, a ZZ plant, sometimes called a cardboard palm. Down here at the base, this actually can store some moisture in there. So the only thing that can go wrong is you can kill this with kindness. Gotcha. Um, it's better if you keep it on the dry side. It will literally, literally sort of hold moisture in that stem. And I'll water this plant maybe once every four to six, sometimes even eight weeks between watering. Yeah, that's great. So it's really wow. easy to care for. Mm -hmm. And while we're talking about plants that will tolerate neglect and don't need a lot of watering, uh, nice little dish garden here we made up with some ah. succulents. Uh, again, you've got this succulents, they've got that fleshy leaf, they're able to take that moisture up and hold it in there. Uh, and like Debbie's yeah, showing you, we have a bunch ones. of these little tiny ones. So if you can you can create your create your own little composition mm -hmm. with them. Whoops, sorry. There we go. Um, again, while I was saying I have five plants in my home, ZZ plants, one of them, succulents is, is, the, another? is another one. Um, <laughs> He's for the easy it, care. Well, that's because people give them to me. I don't, yeah. I don't even go, but, but Regina <laughs> made a nice terrarium for me at one time with succulents yes. like this. And, um, and it's holding up well, even oh. in my neglectful care. They're fun. So again, you water them well, let them dry out, and that's really the only attention they need, as well as providing the proper amount of weight for them. Well, we're going to take a quick break and come back with the next sense. We'll let you guess which one it is. Thank you. As, as you're seeing here, fire pits. Now, we were talking about site before. This is a perfect example of something outside for site. Fire pits, fireplaces. So wonderful. Exactly. It draws your attention visually, but you know, I was also thinking it appeals to the sense of touch because of the heat. Mm -hmm. Also, the tense sense of smell with the burning, and also the sense of sound as Absolutely. you hear the fire crackling. crackling. Ah, it's perfect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so that's what we're talking about today, how you use all of your senses to observe and enjoy your garden. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were talking about visually looking at plants. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how you can add that element of sound Absolutely. into your landscape. We've got some very interesting examples here. Right, and, and as I said, it, you know, these ideas apply both inside and outside. Um, there are indoor fountains. Uh, now these, these are very special creations that uh, you're looking at. I should say that they're available exclusively at our Fair Oaks right, location. Right, only Fair Oaks. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's an uh, artist, Jim Mueller, who uh, actually constructs these and composes them and then puts them out into our right. greenhouse uh, for sale, so right. they are intended for indoor use. And we've got a couple of those, I think, to see. Right. You want to show uh, the other two? There we now, go. the other, I was um, kind of looking on his website. One of the things I thought was so neat, you know, it fits so well with our uh, talk today, is he discusses how these really appeal to all senses that's in there because obviously it's a, it's a visual composition that's there. Right. Uh, it's a very, very gentle sound, or again, that depends a little bit on the type of fountain or composition mm -hmm. that you select, you know, but you do have the trickling water providing that sound that's in there. He will actually come in sometimes and put fragrances, um, essential plant oils, mm -hmm. into the water so you can actually get a nice fragrance to it. That's how I met him once. I was walking through the greenhouse and just this wonderful, wonderful fragrance wafting. coming through. <laughs> and I went over, was like tracking it down, and I found it was Jim sort mm -hmm. of manicuring his fountains. I believe it might have even been a basil oil wow. or something. So he starts showing me his different fragrances and stuff that he right. put in there. Right. So you can definitely add that element of sound and use that. So we do have our use our visually we're attracted to it but then that sound that's right. that other dimension and there are others uh, you know other indoor fountains we've got a couple of set up well several set up at, at the Fair Oaks store and at all the stores but uh, yeah. just lots of choices there which are which are wonderful also outside is another opportunity to use sound this is this is actually Amy's pond out at, at her house and she was telling me how you know they're in a townhouse so they can hear you know from their bedroom window they can hear this you know, trickling water going on, so it's wonderful. Nice, soothing sound. Yeah, it is. And um, like I said, that you think of that, you know, in the summertime. But you know, a lot of people they leave their uh, 
fountains running right through the winter time mm -hmm. again. So that's an option that you can right. also have. And again, outside there's more opportunities. There's the you know the bubbling fountains and the and the clay pots or the uh, the pebble, pebble pots. Just mm -hmm. lots of choices yeah. for that. And we need that to, in my case to mask all the the right. noise that's back there too. Right. So Absolutely. It's, it's great. Yeah. And there's other ways I can you can use plants to provide mm -hmm. that element of sound. You can actually observe plants with your ears. Right. Okay. And grasses are just wonderful. That really, they're wonderful, you know, to hear that rustling in the wind. Exactly. The wind blowing through there, so kind of, you know, you see them moving, but then you can also hear it on a nice breezy day. And then you and can even hear what's it? coming up next. Ah, wind chimes. Don't forget wind chimes. Yeah. And we have a huge <laughs> selection at the store. I mean, you know, we just brought yeah, this nice. little one in uh, because, you know, but we have, you know, right. All, all sizes, sizes. and styles <laughs> and everything's imaginable. Uh, and great gifts. I was helping a customer the other day and selecting them as a gift for mm -hmm. their daughter. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't great. like wind I chimes? I know, really. Exactly. Okay, let's see, what's next? So we talked about sight, we what's talked about smell? sound, um, also the smell, mm -hmm. exactly. We observe our gardens with our nose. And no mystery to any of us, I mean, there's so many wonderfully fragrant plants that are out there. This Stephanotis, again, this is an indoor plant. Uh, we have them in the garden center right now. The fragrance on these is just outstanding. Oh, yes. When you happen to go walking by and you catch this, I mean, it's a beautiful flower uh, with that dark green leaf. This is actually a vine, so a lot of times we have them trained on uh, little topiaries or something. And it's also a favorite for wedding bouquets. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. People use, again, for that beautiful fragrance that's in there. Now, of course, the plants, they're producing the fragrance because they are doing that to lure uh, pollinators in. Uh, jasmine, which is a, a wonderful, beautifully fragrant plant. Uh, again, these come from tropical parts of the world. I know I get a lot of my customers that are from parts of Asia and India, and that apparently I've never traveled there, but they say in the summertime, just the street smell of jasmine. Mm -hmm. and, it, and a lot of people yes. want to recreate that in their home. Uh, I've heard and sometimes people that this smell is almost overwhelming, overwhelming. to them, yeah. but um, <coughs> that's hard for me to imagine. <laughs> yeah, and there's so many great plants uh, that we have in our greenhouse, again, for this. Gardenias, that's a, a favorite of everybody's. Now, we've talked about there have been some gardenias that are developed for use out in the landscape, but this really, this classic, beautiful, solid white one with dark green, these are not really reliably winter hardy. They do need to be kept indoors. It can be a little bit finicky, uh, sensitive to the moisture. Uh, a lot of these plants, they just want to be, find that perfect balance, not wet, not dry, just kind of keeping them uniformly moist and bright light, keeping them out of drafts, so a little bit of a protected environment. Citrus, uh, you know, which in this case, I think we're looking at a kumquat, but we've got lemons and limes and uh, even occasionally get a kumquat in here. Oh, they're, they're, their fragrance is just phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, and, and that counts for taste as well. Exactly. <coughs> I mean, and visually, they're beautiful. That's right. Uh, there you go. Yes. But citrus, you really do need good, sunny environment in your home. That's a plant that needs some direct sun to be mm -hmm. successful with that. Uh, and then we've got a picture here of Mahonia. Mahonia is out in the landscape. Uh, again, our focus has been on plants that are for indoors because uh, it's that time of year. But you know what? Uh, these same ideas are true out in the landscape. Mahonia is a plant that will flower for us usually in February and March. It's mm -hmm. actually a, a late winter bloomer. Yellow blossoms on it. And there are even varieties that have been selected specifically for their fragrance. Right. We'll have to bring Amy back on in this <coughs> a little later on to do really focus on the outside yeah, garden absolutely. for the five senses. Okay. But again, these, these same ideas, like I said, they carry forward. Right. All right, we're going to take we're time Let's take going? a break. Okay. No, let's take a break. And we'll, when we come back, we'll talk about touch. We'll be right back. Okay, we've got two senses left. We've got touch and taste. Absolutely. So touch is another way that we're going to observe plants. We'll just start out with some of our pictures. This is a, an obvious choice mm -hmm. that's there. <laughs> that you don't want to touch. Right. This is a do not touch Do me. not touch. Uh, but it's, again, it's a reminder that, you know, the plants, you know, they have made these adaptations, you know, for their own survival. In this case, you know, the, um, 
with cactus, true cactus, the leaves have atrophied, there's no leaves, the photosynthesis takes place in the stems, and the stipules have adapted into those spines. So it's really a moisture conserving mm -hmm. adaptation, and then of course with the spines there to stop herbivores from coming to feed on. So again, it's great defense systems developed by the plant, but of course it's a good way, you know, you know, we can definitely right. observe that as well. It's like, say, leave me alone kind uh -huh. of adaptation. Now, the Sansevieria, or uh, sometimes called snake plant or mother-in-law's tongue, uh, you know, if you were to, to touch this, I mean, it's got very smooth, um, firm leaf mm -hmm. that's in there. You know, it almost is kind inviting you to go in yeah. there and, mm -hmm. and sort of touch and feel it right. that's in there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's a plant that's about indestructible. When I yes. have people coming in looking for plants that really don't have a green thumb, that's a great one to go to. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it just thrives on the neglect you can mm -hmm. put in low light Lower environments. Light. And there's a huge number of varieties in there. We were just looking at that picture, the classic one, right. but there's you know twisted ones, there's different variegation colors, so great selection there of the sand of area. And of course, bromeliads. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, this it's kind of interesting. It's the same family of plants from pineapples, if you can imagine. Uh, of course, these are grown for their floral characteristic, the colorful bracts in there that peel to our eyes. But if you were to go in there and feel this, a lot of them will have little spines like saw teeth along the edge of the leaf. Uh, it's a very um, almost dry kind of feel to mm -hmm. it, very rigid. Again, those are adaptations the plant has to prevent moisture loss right. um, and also to collect water in that little bowl so they've adapted their environment, uh, but it gives us uh, added enjoyment and new sensations. Just oh, they are. I mean, and you can just, it's, it's like say, a lifetime mm -hmm. you could spend looking at these. There's right. so many of them. Uh, this is one that really just I, I challenge you to walk past it <laughs> and not want to reach over there and pet this. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's called a foxtail fern. It's a type of asparagus fern. But you can see that name, that foxtail fern. It's almost you know, where you do want to just sort of run your hands over there and, and sort of brush it and mm -hmm. comb it along there. Uh, again, a tough, durable plant, one that does need good sunlight if you're trying to grow it in your house. Uh, but other than that, pretty carefree. Right. And then I think we have one more picture. And we're going back for seconds to look at the succulents. Ag absolutely. Uh, we now this is more of an outdoor varieties of, of succulents here. Yeah, and again, these are all adaptations to conserve moisture. It makes them so easy to grow. They're really growing in popularity for use on containers and on the outside, on, on tables mm -hmm. and such, because they don't require the frequent watering and right. attention that's in there. And again, the leaves are just juicy, so you know, when mm -hmm. you touch, you really shouldn't squeeze them too much, you know, like, I'm thinking like, please don't squeeze that's the right. Charmin thing, but you know, sometimes you just can't help yourself, and, and we understand that. Okay, but, so we've got a couple live plants to show here. And live plants, also in that do not touch category. Mm -hmm. uh, this is technically, it's a, it's a crown of thorns. Uh, it's a euphorbia, it's in the same family as poinsettias are. So if you were to look at the little flowers on there with some imagination, you might think um, poinsettia. But again, along this are the spines that are on there as those thick. I don't know if you can get in close enough to see Probably not gonna be able to see not. the thorns that are in there. But um, they're in there. <laughs> yeah, but it, um, you know, it's sort of, the lore has it, the name comes from this, it's thought some people believe this was the plant that was used for, um, you know, to make the crown of thorns, right. you know, for Christ during the crucifixion, mm. because it does have some pretty sturdy yes. thorns in there. So it's a, um, we're talking about the sense of touch, but definitely a look, but don't touch right. type mm -hmm. of plant that's in there. Mm -hmm. Now, sort of by contrast, or exact opposite this is a real on there, touch. <laughs> this would be definitely a touchy feely plant. Uh, we I call it rabbit's this. foot fern. I still remember when I was just a child starting out gardening, this is one of the first plants that I grew again because I was so intrigued with that rhizome that just looks like a little rabbit's foot Isn't in there, cool? cane group home. And it is okay. You can go in there and you mm -hmm. can pet this. That one is <laughs> not going to be spiny, whereas the other one would be telling you to back off. And one well, more. And the fern itself is so light and dainty, too. It's just a contrast yeah. there. A real it is, contrast. So much. I know I'm moving through these quickly, but that's because we brought so many yep. of them. This is um, a peperomia when there's many different types of peperomia, but of course this would be the watermelon peperomia. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, you know, goes with our theme today. You know, we're talking about touch, but also the watermelon thing. Absolutely. Of course, it's not edible. It's just because the leaf on there kind of makes you think of a watermelon mm -hmm. rind on it. 
but if you if you feel this again it's got that glossy kind of leaf on there very smooth glossy succulent mm -hmm. I mean it, it really it's a, a nice way to observe plants absolutely um, in contrast okay and our last sense Taste. Last, but probably most important, right. would be taste, because that is definitely how we choose to experience plants. Mm -hmm. You know, needless to say, so many plants in our, our diet, um, but we were going to speak specifically to the um, herbs. So you're looking at a topiary of rosemary. Uh, rosemary, of course, it's a great plant culinary use. There are hardy varieties that you can grow out in your garden, but we also shape them up like this for use indoors. And because, of course, we're eating year-round and want to enjoy plants year-round, well, you know, growing herbs on your windowsill is fantastic, even at this time of the mm -hmm. year. So I just, I've got a whole selection that's in here. Yeah. Um, we've got things like the oregano uh, in here, you know, sage, thyme. You know, these are all examples of what we refer to commonly as Mediterranean herbs. They like sunny conditions, bright, well-drained kind of environment. So if you're growing them in a combination pot or a little herb pot, then it is best if these are sort of grouped together uh, because they're going to have that similar environment. Then we have things like parsley and chives here. They are plants that like a cooler, slightly moister condition. Mm -hmm. So you'd almost either group them together but in sort of a separate pot right that's right. out there and that kind of goes along hand in hand with what we've talked about earlier in the in this back in the summer having your garden close by you know you don't have to have a huge big garden you can have a, a small garden container garden with vegetables and herbs right outside your door this is right in you know, you can have inside your house for them yeah absolutely and for outside. the winter time mm -hmm. it's there and I just have to say it's I think it's again interesting that plants these adaptations, the ones that have the, um, the fragrant leaves, that mm -hmm. have the tasteful leaves, these are defenses that the plants have adapted to try to keep herbivores and insects away from them. Uh, you think of the things like the, some of the alkaloids that are produced like uh, in wine, the tannins that mm -hmm. we like, or the caffeine that's in coffee. They're actually binding to the proteins, and so when we get kind of that bitter taste in our mouth and we seek that out, uh -huh. but of course that's the way a plant is fending off insects, mm -hmm. that same little bitter taste could be really repellent or even deadly to That's insects right, that are in yeah. there. Mm -hmm. The fragrances that they have are trying to keep things like, you know, the deer, which we deal with so mm -hmm. much. A lot of times we use things like rosemary and sage and plants are very highly aromatic to keep the animals away from. Right. So it's just interesting <laughs> how plants, I think they've adapt, made all these adaptations. Oh, I know. But then, of course, we adapt to that. That's right. For our use that's in there <laughs> in, in so many different ways. Great. Great. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll take your phone call. So if you have any questions, please give us a call, 703-387-1046. It's phone call time, so if you have any questions, give us a call, 703-387-1046. David, our first caller is Barbara, who's calling from Greenbelt. Hi, Barbara. Hi, good morning. Good How morning. are you guys today? Great. Oh, How we're about doing you? Great. I'm good, thank you. Good. Um, I, before Christmas, I bought a small uh, potted Norfolk pine tree, uh, which is now sitting out in my enclosed porch, so it's exposed to the air. And I'm wondering what would be the best treatment for it to keep it alive all year round. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a plant that really I don't think it wants to see temperatures much below 40. So the first thing I'm wondering ah. about when you say an enclosed porch, is it heated or unheated? Unheated, yes. Okay. It's open to the air. Uh, Dear, dear, to me, it sounds like you're taking a bit of a risk there. Like I said, I, if okay. you're getting temperatures that are really below 40, that's mm -hmm. not great. If it goes below freezing, that might be enough to kill the plant. Uh, Norfolk Island pines, you know, you've seen them growing outdoors, maybe even down in Florida and, you know, along uh -huh. the southern coast. But up here, it's pretty much considered an indoor plant. Okay, uh, good. So it's one, again, it's, it wants to be kept sort of uniformly moist. You kind of avoid the extremes. You know, if it, it, it will not tolerate wet conditions. So I'd rather, if anything, keep it a little bit on the dry side. Right. Uh, cool temperatures, fine. Freezing temperatures, not so fine. Okay. And a bright, indirect light. Uh, in their natural environment, that plant can grow to be 40, 50 feet tall. Uh, oh. don't, you're not going to see that in your house, so don't no. worry. It's perfectly suitable as a house plant. But if you give it proper care, they can live a long time. And um, 
uh, sometimes we do have trouble where eventually they kind of outgrow their space. And watering maybe once a week or should it be soaked? Uh, you're just going to kind of have to monitor that. Uh, yeah. How big is the pot? Oh, I don't really know about <clears throat> 10 inches maybe. Yeah. I'm thinking more like every 10 to 14 days on the watering, but uh, use your judgment there. Okay. As I'm always saying, it should feel kind of like a damp sponge. You want to avoid either extreme of soaking wet or bone dry. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much. You've been most helpful. I appreciate it. Okay, better thank bring you. it inside. we got some cold weather yeah, coming. really. Okay, our next caller is Lynn, who's calling from Woodbridge. Hi, Lynn. Hello, how are you? Good, Doing and you? just great. That's great. Um, I had a question for you. Um, I was wondering if you could have any tips for growing herbs indoors, like, and well, what would do best, um, but parsley and oregano and things like that. Um, whenever I try and grow things indoors from seeds, they get kind of spindly. Right. Next week, we're, our show is going to be devoted on growing from seed. But uh, I can tell you right now, the quick answer is that is just insufficient light. And that is, the, as we're talking about, anytime you're growing indoors, and we've touched on that a little bit today, um, getting sufficient light is really the, the key factor, the limiting factor, it's there. If you're trying to start seeds, uh, you're really not gonna be able to do that with just sunlight from a window. No matter how bright it is, it's gonna be difficult. You'll need to invest in some supplemental lighting uh, to get enough light intensity to be, really be successful with that. I always see sometimes people have these beautiful little um, greenhouse windows in their kitchen. You know, I'm always envious of that. You know, if you're, if you're able to create that kind of environment, you know, then you can do really well. Um, otherwise, you might be better off. We sell like these little starter plants we're showing. Uh, you can just come in buy, the garden center and buy some, a few little small plants. You might be better off there. Some of the easier ones are the greens like basil, you know, parsley. Uh, you know, those are going to be some of your easier ones, even sage or oregano. I've had trouble growing rosemary myself. Uh, it thrives outside, but it's a little challenging on the indoors. Okay, well, I think um, I will get the potted plant and save the seeds for summertime and throw them outside. Great, and we'll talk about that in more detail next week. Great. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Okay, let's see. Shirley is calling from Vienna. Hi, Shirley. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Good. Uh, my question is about <clears throat> um, the hydrangeas. <laughs> I have an endless summer hydrangea, and I wondered when and how much I should prune the, the old branches back. Okay. Well, Shirley, you've got a lot of flexibility on how you want to prune that plant. Uh, there's really not a right or wrong answer to this, but what I would suggest uh, is right now you just kind of leave it alone. But as we start getting into that March, April time period, I would go out and just do a, a very light trimming, just to sort of shape it up, you know, and I wouldn't cut it back too severely, just sort of maybe take four to six inches off it or whatever you need to do to get sort of a nice shape. And then it will flush out as you go into you know, May, June, should start giving you a set of blooms in July. When those July flowers start to fizzle out, then you can deadhead it, almost like a rose, you know, where you cut the spent flowers out, and that will continue to repeat bloom. Now, if it's really getting too big um, and uh, needs to be cut back drastically, you can do that, and with endless summer, it will still come back and it will re-bloom for you, but you've kind of sacrificed that first set of buds and it might bloom a little bit later in the season. So I'd only do that heavy pruning if it's getting way, way too big for the location. Oh, well, thank you so much. That really helps. Okay, good. Yeah, an endless summer is one of the few that you can prune that way. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I love that plant right? because it's really easier to care for. Yes, great. Okay, have a great weekend. Okay, let's see. Joanne is calling from Waldorf. Hi, Joanne. Hi, how are you? Good, and you? Good. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year the show. Oh, uh, thanks. My question is, I have peonies that have broken ground. If it's too soon since it's so cold outside, do I need to cover them over? Is it okay? I've got hyacinths, uh, peonies, and some tulips that have started to come up. Your bulbs I'm not concerned about. A lot of things like the hyacinths and daffodils and tulips and crocus, and a lot of these will send... Um, you know, some leaves up, and that's perfectly normal. Uh, the, the flower bud's still down there, it's protected. I'm a little surprised to hear that you're getting growth on the, the peonies. Uh, 
that that's just a little bit surprised to me because they they do like the cold weather. I still think if your peonies, if it, we're talking about just little tiny shoots and buds up there, I think we're okay. If you're actually getting to where you're starting to see some foliage, some leaves develop, you might want to consider putting a little bit of light mulch over there uh, just to give them that added protection through this cold weather that's coming. Yeah. But they're going to be okay. You're not going to lose any plants and the flowers are still going to be protected. Great. Well, thank you so much for the call. We are, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back with more of your questions. Stay tuned. Okay, this hour flies by, so sure let's get does. right back to our callers. Uh, CJ is calling from Washington. Hi, CJ. Hello, and Happy New Year. Thank you. And, um, Same to you. Okay, um, my question is going to be about an indoor plant, and like you, I don't take good care of indoor plants because I love outdoors, but <laughs> I have a dracaena. It's really a long, stringy one, and uh, it's, I have the water nannies i guess that's what you call them right two of them and it's uh, my plant is in a um 12 maybe a little larger than a 12 inch plant because it's a sort of a tall uh a pot so it's a tall plant but i want to know about using the plant nanny so it's about watering them and the kind of light that it should be in because i have it in the, in my and near a dining room window it's pulled right. away from the radiator well, CJ, I tell you, you've hit on one of the other five plants that I have. Literally, I've got a ZZ plant, and like I say, I've got the Dracaena mm -hmm. they are talking about. I've got a Sansevera. I mean, these are the, these are the tough ones. So again, the, uh, basically that plant, you know, it, it's one that if it gets almost scary dry, mm -hmm. you know, it will still survive. Uh, the plant nanny, I've never used them, but uh, that's a, a convenient labor-saving way of um, watering the plants. Uh, my guess from what you're telling me is you could probably refill those plant nannies about once every two weeks and you would be okay with that. Uh, that's a, again, the people know that the Dracaena has got these beautiful foliage, these nice leaves that come up. Uh, the brighter the light, the better, because it will give you more intense coloration in there. But it is a plant that will continue to live and grow even under low light conditions. Okay. The only thing you can really do to harm that plant is overwatering it. Make sure that that soil does have an opportunity to dry out slightly between waterings. Uh, if there's any doubt, I would rather let it get too dry than to keep it too wet. The only way you'll kill it is if, if you keep that soil constantly saturated, that's going to be a problem. I've had mine get so dry that it literally falls off the shelf, and then I say, oh, I guess, guess I need the water. To water. Right. <laughs> so, so if you have any doubt, let it get dry, but if you keep it wet, that will that's the only way you can really kill it. Okay, and gnats. What about little, every gnats. now and then I see little gnats. I knew somebody was gonna call about spite, <laughs> about fungus gnats today. Did you ask I her know, to call? No, but I knew. <laughs> and I wanted to show off this, this is a brand new product. I'm saying this is new for 2014. All right. Um, First new product of the year. Right. It's exclusive. We own to our Fair Oaks store. Okay. Because we just well, tried it out. Well, that's two things of Fair Oaks today. <laughs> well, because we're, you know, that's where I work and we're yeah. trying some stuff out. Uh, and what happened, the uh, manufacturer gave us a sample of this. Uh, Shirley, our greenhouse manager, tested it, mm -hmm. got some good results, and then we just bought it in and received a case of this um, yesterday. Okay. This is, it's, a, it's finely ground glass. So oh. it is glass. But it has been ground down to a very, very fine particulate, as very light it's and fluffy. Growstone nat mix. Nat mix. Okay. And basically, you just put a, a coating of this on top of the soil. The fungus gnats, the larvae, develop down in the soil, and then they emerge through there as that adult gnat that's buzzing around your mm -hmm. house. Uh, so this is easy. Uh, it's it's sort of a non-toxic approach. You just put this on there. And because you have that layer of little finely ground glass in there, the, um, the gnats can't permeate down through it. They can't get down to lay eggs in the soil, and they can't emerge through it to cut the escape out as an adult. So cool. we've had some pretty good success with that. Mm -hmm. And I put that out. I'm going to give you one, show one other here, these um, mosquito bits, because this is, again, a natural product. It's a bacteria. You put this on the surface of the soil and the bacteria kills the larvae down in there. So there's really Great. two 
um, easy, non-toxic options are available to Super. you. Super. Okay. Perfect question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. knew you were going to call, All CJ, right. and I was ready for that one. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Okay, let's see. Our next caller is Diane, who's calling from Fort Washington. Hi, Diane. Hello. Hey, how are well, you? I'm good in yourself. Good, thanks. Happy New Year. Thank you. You too. Oh, thank you. What, what's your question? Okay, uh, just two quick questions. I uh, went on a website called Winter Sow that said that you could probably um, sow your uh, seeds now outside and they won't germinate until it's time for them to germinate. Yeah. Now, so are you talking I, about I grass seed? About that. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Diane. It's, it's kind of seed specific. Which, uh, which type of seeds are you talking about? You know, it, it really didn't say which kinds. I think it's seeds that are kind of cold hardy. Exactly. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that it would be okay to sow my seeds outside now. Well, there, it's kind of a yes and no answer, and that's, that's always the way it is, I think, with gardening. There's never one answer. Uh, there's options that are out there. What they're talking about is a dormant seeding. So, for example, I had two or three people in the garden center just this week purchasing grass seed. A lot of people do this practice where they broadcast the seed out there, the, the snow and the rains and everything, wash it down into the soil. But it's not going to germinate until the soil temperature gets up to about 55 degrees. So seed germination requires both temperature and moisture. Uh, I've heard of people doing this with greens like spinach and um, you know, even cabbage and you know, collards and kale and some of these cool season vegetables and plants and grass seed. So as a cool weather plant, I would say yes, you could do that. You put it out there, it's getting worked into the soil. When the temperatures rise, it will germinate next spring. Okay, thank you. And my quick final I, question. I, I, we I'm are out so of sorry. Time. We are totally out of time. And we'll talk about that in more detail <laughs> yes. next week. Next week we'll be talking about seed starting. So, thank you for for joining us. Thank you for filling in. Great topic. Uh, be sure to to go by the seminars. You have to choose which one you're going to at at 10 a.m. at all three locations. David's going to run right out of here and head to Fair Oaks for his. That is a tough choice. I know. Easy choice really for me choice. though. Right. I don't have a choice. <laughs> have a great week. See you next time.